Well, this morning we return to our study of Psalm 33. We took a break for our missions conference, but we're back to Psalm 33 this morning. And I remind you, this is a psalm about praising God. See this clearly from the opening verses of the psalm as David commands the people of God to praise the Lord, he even instructs us how to praise him. Notice how the psalm begins. <clears throat> Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the, with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Now with these words, David tells his people, Israel, and by way of application, it's to us, that when God's people gather to worship him, we are to make sure that we worship him correctly. We're not on our own. He's given us some instruction on how he wants us to worship him. And that's what these verses do. And that, David says, involves, number one, singing joyfully to the Lord, which means we are to put our, our hearts into it. We are, to, we are to put our souls into it. We are to have some passion in what, when we're singing. We are to think about what we're singing. We are to consider who we are singing to. We are conscious of the fact that we're not just mouthing words. We are singing to the Lord. In other words, our singing should have some feeling behind it. It should never be mindless. It should never be mechanical. It should never be that we're going just through a religious routine of singing some words without giving any consideration to the meaning behind those words and to whom we are directing those words. Secondly, David also instructs us that corporate worship, and that's what he's talking about when we gather together to worship, corporate worship should involve music and musical instruments, which he says should be played well. He says they should be done skillfully. And when we sing to the Lord accompanied by music, he says the songs that we sing to him should be a new song, a new song. Now, as we said before, and I repeat it again, this does not mean that all of our songs should be modern. All of them should be contemporary or that we should avoid singing older songs. No, that, that's not at all what David means. See, by new song, David means that the songs we sing to the Lord should reflect a new appreciation for God's fresh work of grace in our lives. And the reason for this is because the Lord is always at work in our lives because sanctification is an ongoing process. We never stay static in our Christian lives because God is, is always doing some work of grace in our lives. He teaches us truths which we've never seen before or he applies old truths to our lives in new and fresh ways, or he gives us fresh experiences that enable us to see that his mercies are indeed new every morning, as the Bible says. And it's these fresh applications, folks, of, of God's grace and these new discoveries and affirmations of biblical truth that ought to come to our minds as we are singing to the Lord. So that while we may be singing songs that are older, and we may be very familiar with them, we sing them with new applications in mind so that every song then becomes a new song. That's the point that David is making. Listen, it is important that when we gather for worship on Sundays, we, we try hard to avoid falling into the rut that can easily happen when we're singing. Joel and our praise team and our choir members and our musicians, they do a fantastic job of helping us to focus on the Lord in our worship. But it's up to us to work hard at following their lead because it is very easy to become so comfortable with songs that we are familiar with that we, we don't even allow the meaning of these songs and their truths to penetrate our lives. We don't allow them to, to stretch us spiritually by forcing us to, to think about the Lord and what he's presently, currently doing in our, in our lives. I remember speaking to a woman a number of years ago who only wanted to sing 
older hymns that, that she was familiar with, that she was accustomed to, that she had grown up hearing, and she wanted nothing to do with, with any contemporary music which she was unfamiliar with. And I said to her at that time that it's important that we, we sing contemporary songs. I mean, it's important we sing great songs regardless of what age they were written. But I said to her, it is important for us to sing contemporary songs that we're not used to because an unknown song tends to make us think. It stimulates us to think about what we're actually singing. And this stretches us. That's the word I used with her. This stretches us. It forces us to come out of our comfort zone. And I told her, I said, and that's a good thing. The Lord wants to stretch us. You know what her response to me was? She was very dear, but this is what she said. She said, but I don't want to be stretched. I don't want to come out of my comfort zone. Well, I told her that I appreciated her honesty, but being a Christian necessitated that she be stretched by the Lord. And the, and the worship of God is one of the ways that the Lord stretches us as we sing songs to him, whether old or modern, that force us to think about how he is currently working in our lives. Not something he did 25 years ago, but how he is currently working in our lives. You have to be stretched. We have to come out of our comfort zone. And so David begins Psalm 33 by calling us to worship the Lord and to do it, he says, according to these guidelines. These are divine guidelines as David is an inspired writer. However, having called us to worship the Lord, David moves on in his psalm to explain why we should worship God and why we should praise God. And he does this by giving us reasons for worshiping him. Now, the way he does this is by telling us what God is like, at least to some degree. It doesn't, it's not exhaustive, but what God is like. <coughs> See, as we've said before, genuine godly worship is always based upon the truth about God so that our praise flows out of a correct understanding of him, a proper theology. In other words, our praise of God is based on what he's revealed about himself, his character qualities, his, his attributes, his divine nature, so that we praise him for who he is and how great he is. This is precisely what Jesus was talking about when he said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, he said, those who worship the Father must worship him, number one, in spirit. What does that mean? It means the inner right attitude. I don't believe the Lord was talking about the Holy Spirit at that point, but our spirit, our hearts, our, our inner attitudes. And he said they must worship the Father not only in spirit, right heart attitude, but also in truth, meaning that our worship must be based upon the truth about God, which is revealed in the word of God. And that's why as David continues Psalm 33, he mentions several truths about what God is like, his attributes. Notice verses 4 and 5. For the word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Now listen carefully because these two verses are really the key to understanding the rest of the psalm. They, they open up our understanding because in these two verses... David gives us a summary statement. That's all it is, a summary statement of four specific attributes of God for which we are to praise him. We are to praise him, number one, for his power. We are to praise him, number two, for his faithfulness. We are to praise him, number three, for his righteousness and justice, which goes together. And number four, we are to praise him for his love, for his loving kindness. In other words, when we are giving thanks to the Lord, and when we are singing to him, and when we are telling him how much we appreciate him, and how much we love him, these attributes that David mentions here of God are just some of the things that we are to tell him when we express our love to him. This is what we love him for, and we are to tell him that. Now, this is not, as I said, this is not an exhaustive list of God's attributes. David only mentions four 
of the Lord's attributes. But in doing so, what he's telling us is that when we do praise God, we are to remember these attributes about him. And we are to praise him for this. So the first attribute that he mentions is God's power. Now I'm, I'm reviewing, but also pressing home some things. First attribute he mentions is God's power, which is illustrated by the force and the authority of his word. He says, for the word of the Lord is upright, which means that it is straightforward. It is direct. It stands upright, tall and straight and direct. Whatever God says is clear, and it always comes to pass. And the reason for this is because of his authoritative power, that power which is behind his word. He speaks, and it's done. The second of God's attributes that David mentions is God's faithfulness. We've just been singing about how faithful the Lord is. David says that all his work, all of God's work is done in faithfulness. What he means by this is that God's plans, his will, those works that he has sovereignly decreed will come to pass. They will always come to pass. And they'll come to pass. Why? Because God is faithful to fulfill his plans, regardless of the plans and intentions of man. Those plans that may stand in opposition to God. It doesn't matter who opposes God. Whatever God says that he's planned to happen will happen. In other words, what David is telling us is God is dependable, faithful to do his work. He always accomplishes his plans and nothing stands in his way. Now, the third divine attribute that David mentions is righteousness and justice. He says he loves righteousness and justice. God, by his nature, is perfectly righteous. He always does what is right because he's the standard of what is right. Whatever he does is right. He's the standard of what's right. And because he's righteous, he, he's always just. He's always fair in that all of his actions in governing man, all those actions are based on perfect justice without any taint of dishonesty or corruption or impropriety. The fourth and final divine attribute mentioned by David is God's love. He says, the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. So after telling us that we are called to praise God, David immediately mentions these four attributes of God, and he does this in order to enhance and improve our praise of God by telling us, and this is what he's doing, he's telling us how great the Almighty is. It's one thing to say praise him, it's another thing to say this is how magnificent he is, this is why you should praise him. See, folks, our praise of God, our worship of him, will only be as strong as our knowledge of him. The more you and I know who God is and what he's like, the greater and the deeper and the more meaningful will be our praise of him. Listen, if you are going to offer praise to God, then you have to have a reason to praise him. And the reason for praising him is always because his character is so wonderful and so remarkable and so perfect. We ought to be in awe of him because he truly is awesome. That's precisely why David mentions these four attributes. He wants us to praise God for the glory of his character. But watch this. In order to press home and to penetrate to our hearts these truths, these truths about God's character that David wants us to, to know, he presses home because he takes the remainder of this psalm to explain to us each of these four divine attributes by showing us how God puts these attributes or has put them on display in his activities in the world, how he shows his attributes to us. Now, the last time we studied Psalm 33, we looked at David's explanation of two of these divine attributes in action. First, he wrote about how God's power is seen in the authority of of his word, how it was demonstrated at creation when he spoke, just spoke the world into existence. Notice verses six through nine. By the word of the Lord, 
the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all of their host, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now, when we read about the incredible power that God possesses, so that at creation, he just spoke the words, let there be, and the universe was made, it ought to have an impact on us. That's the point. It should cause us to stop what we're doing and stand in awe of God. This one who can just speak and it happens. See, instead of just reading about the the story of creation in Genesis, we should be astounded, just absolutely astounded at such power displayed by the Lord. It ought to cause us to worship him, to adore him. This is not just academics. It's beyond academics. It's impactful of our lives. It should lead us to sing with freshness and newness. A song like that great Isaac Watts hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Listen to these words of praise about the power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day, The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed, where'er I turn my eye, if I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care, and everywhere that man can be, thou God are present there. Now, folks, that is praising God for being the amazing one that he is, that he just speaks and it happens. So when we sing a song like like that, and you're thinking about those words and the God whose, whose actions are displayed and glorified in those words, we are praising him for his power, which is exactly what he wants us to do because he is all-powerful. He is omnipotent, and he wants to be acknowledged and honored by us for being omnipotent. Now, after explaining about God's attribute of power, the second attribute that David mentions and then expands on is God's faithfulness to accomplish his sovereign plans. Notice, he said in verse 4, all his work is done in faithfulness. And what David does now in verses 10 through 12 is tell us that the plans of the nations, plans of the nations of the world to destroy Israel will not happen. And the reason they won't materialize is because they are opposed to God's plan to bless the Jewish people. And God's plan, he says, will happen because he is faithful. He is dependable to bring his plan to fruition. Notice verses 10 through 12. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Now, the point Of all of this information about the nations of the world and the nation of Israel is to prompt us to give God the praise that he deserves. Why? Because he controls world events so that his will is accomplished. Even though it might seem that the events on the world scene today are just spinning out of control, we are assured by verses like these, that God is in control of the affairs of men. And he, he's bringing his plans to pass. Even though today the nations of the world that make up the United Nations, at least most of them, continue to blame Israel for any action that they take to defend themselves, and there are nations and there are terrorist groups that are strategizing even now on how to destroy Israel, we are assured 
that God will preserve the Jewish state. And he'll do it because that's what his plan is. And he is faithful, we're told here, to accomplish all of his plans. So when we praise him, we are to praise him for his faithfulness to bring about his will. And so having looked at David's explanation of God's attributes of his power and his faithfulness, David now proceeds to expand on the next two divine attributes, which he mentioned back in verse 5, God's righteousness and justice, and then his love. First, he talks about God's righteousness and justice. Notice what David tells us in verses 13 through 15. He says, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works. Now, in these verses, David explains what it means that God is righteous and just. But the way he does this is is a little unusual because he doesn't directly say anything about God being righteous or just. But that is his point, and I'll show you what he means by this. Instead, David speaks of, of the Lord as looking out from heaven his dwelling place, and he's watching the sons of men, meaning the inhabitants of the earth, all of humanity. And what's God doing watching us? Well, David says in verse 15 that he who fashions the hearts of all of them understands all of their works. Meaning that since God is the one who made our hearts, he knows everything that's in our hearts And so he understands all of our works that flow out of our hearts. Listen closely. The implication is that God in heaven is watching us on earth in order to note this, to evaluate our works to see if we, the inhabitants of the earth, practice righteousness and justice, which he loves. See, the Bible often uses the word heart, as in he who fashions the hearts of them all, to speak of the seat of our thinking, our our thinking, not, not the organ that pumps here. It's the seat of our thinking. And whatever we think expresses what we do in our actions. Out of our hearts flow actions. And so David wants us to know that God sees all that we do. He's constantly evaluating Everything we do, because nothing escapes his gaze, nothing escapes his watchful eye. And what does God see as he evaluates the inhabitants of the earth? What does he observe as he looks upon the entire human race? I'll tell you what he doesn't see. He doesn't see righteousness or justice consistently practiced by the sons of men. But he does see a great deal of unrighteousness and judicial corruption all over the earth. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 gives a stunning description of all of us in our base human sinful nature. Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 18 say this. This is Paul's conclusion about man, all of us. What then? Are we better than they, he's saying, are we who are Jewish better than the Gentiles? Not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There's none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of snakes is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they've not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. This is what we are all like in our base, sinful natures. And what David is telling us here in Psalm 33 is that as God looks upon people, he doesn't see anyone like himself. No one like himself. He doesn't see anyone who loves righteousness and loves justice like he does. 
He doesn't see anyone who practices righteousness and practices justice like he does. He who is exalted in heaven, his dwelling place, who scrutinizes the hearts and the actions of the sons of men, he who looks to see if there's any righteous like he is, is forced to conclude, as did the Apostle Paul, that there are none righteous, no, not even one. So, the question is, how does this understanding of man's sinfulness affect our worship of God? Why is David telling us this? Why is he telling us this? Well, it affects it by presenting us, and note this, with a very sharp contrast. A contrast between God, who loves righteousness and justice, and people who don't love these things. See, as, as you and I experience life, we come in contact with all kinds of people. People who have different physical features, people who come from different nations, different, different cultures, people who have different languages, different mother tongues, people of different personalities and, and temperaments. But regardless of these differences, they all have one thing in common. They're sinful. All. Not one of them is perfectly righteous. Not one of them is perfectly just. Not one conducts his life based on perfect justice and fairness. There's not one government in the world that is perfectly just because no group of citizens is perfectly just. There isn't one person on the planet who is perfectly, totally righteous and treats people fairly all of the time. Instead, we are a race of sinners, and the proof of this is that out of our hearts flow all kinds of sins. Dishonesty, pride, selfishness, prejudice, sensual thoughts, greed, jealousy, covetousness, hatred, malice, and on and on and on it goes. And David's point in telling us this is to impress upon us the truth that God is not like us. That's his point. God is not like us. Unlike sinful man, God is righteous. And God is just in all of his ways. Listen, the Lord never shows partiality. He can never be bought off. He's never guilty of making a decision based upon prejudice or preferential treatment. Ever. Ever. Now, just think about this. The more you and I know about people and their sinful ways, and our own hearts and sinful ways, the more you should appreciate God and his righteousness. I think that's what David is telling us. The more we know about the sin of man, the more we should appreciate and worship and praise God for not being like us, for being righteous and just, because he is unique. There is no one else in the universe who is perfectly righteous and just all the time under every circumstance like our Lord. Listen to some of these verses in the scriptures of, that speak of God's righteousness. Psalm 80, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 37, verse 28, for the Lord loves justice. Psalm 99, verse 4, the strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. It was Abraham who said to God, shall not the, the judge of the whole world do what is right? Yes. So when you praise God, remember to praise him for being righteous and just. This God, who is so powerful as to create something out of nothing by just speaking the word, who is so faithful to sovereignly bring his plans to pass, is also righteous and just so that he will use his power, he will use his ability to complete his plans in opposition to what is evil and unjust. Whatever he does is right, and it is based on justice. Now, so far, David has explained three of God's attributes for which we should praise him. These are the divine attributes that he mentioned back in verses 4 and 5. God's power, God's faithfulness, God's righteousness and justice. But once again, look at verse 5 and notice the fourth and the final attribute that David mentions here. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. 
So just as he did with the other three divine attributes, David now explains how this attributes of God's attribute of God's love is put on display so that we will praise him for it. He says in verses 16 and 17, the king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Now, in explaining how God's love works in his dealings with mankind, surprisingly, David first speaks about not trusting in military power. He says that no king is saved by the strength of his army, nor is a soldier delivered by his own physical power. Neither, he says, is it right to hope in the power of a horse, which in the ancient world represented military strength, to trust a horse's power for victory. Now, the question that we need to ask is why? Why does David speak of military force and power in order to explain God's love? Because that's what he's doing. He's explaining God's love. Well, he does this because, watch this, he wants us to understand the foolishness of placing our trust in such earthly powers as a strong army, physical strength, and a powerful weapon with the hopes of achieving victory and deliverance from our enemies, which in this case meant deliverance from those who were trying to destroy the nation of Israel. In other words, it isn't any of these earthly powers or any earthly power or device that will deliver us in times of trouble. Our deliverance, our victory comes only from the Lord, and it comes from him. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us. He loves his people. That's exactly what David goes on to tell us in verses 18 and 19. He says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. See, David tells us that the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, meaning that God watches over those who trust him in order to protect them, in order to deliver them. That is to say, in contrast to those who trust in military strength, which will not secure victory for them, God does secure military victory for those who trust him. This is the, in the context of Israel. Now, notice why God protects and delivers his people from those who would attack them. David tells us he does it because he loves them. And that's why David says that God's people have placed their hope in his loving kindness. See, what David is telling us is that God should be praised because he loves his people. And since he loves his people, we can trust him. We trust him, not our military or physical strength, to protect and deliver us from all kinds of dangers. That's not where our trust should, should be. Listen, something we should always be praising God for is his unfailing love for us. We're not lovely, but he loves us in spite of the fact. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that God loves us as his children for whom Christ died and secured our salvation. For that, we should be eternally grateful for that amazing love. Listen to these statements in Scripture. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. W what a simple and yet profound verse. If you've not memorized that, you should. And meditate on it, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. We don't have to worry about anything. Cast it upon the Lord. He'll take care of it because he cares for us. Matthew 6, 26, in the context also about worry and anxiety and fretting, and we don't need to do that. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he says, are you not worth much more than they? Yes, we are. Christ didn't die for birds, but he did die for his people. And we have a heavenly father who cares for us. 1 John 3, verse 2, see how great a love the father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God. Imagine that. What a great love 
that we would be called the children of God, that God would adopt us into his family and make us his children. And as the children of God, one of the ways that the Father expresses his love for us is by answering our prayers, by giving us what he deems good for us. Listen to Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Well, what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, meaning a loaf of bread, he'll give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he'll not give him a snake, will he? If you then, listen to this, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? What an amazing truth. What an amazing promise. What an amazing encouragement of God's fatherly love for his own. Now, let's not miss the point that David is making, which is this. God should be praised by us because of his great love for us. And it is because of his love and concern for us that we should trust in him rather than in man's help. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't use people, but our trust must not be in people. It must be in God. See, so often we do place our trust. We place our confidence, our hope in so many things other than God. Earthly props that serve as a substitute for God. And when we trust in these earthly props, we dishonor God by failing to recognize his love for us. And it's because of his love for us and only because of his love for us that he does protect us and he delivers us from so many problems, so many crises. Listen to these wise words from John Piper as he explains why God isn't pleased when our hope is in earthly supports, these earthly props, and not in the Lord. Piper writes this. He's displeased with people who put their hope, for example, in missiles or in makeup, in tanks or tanning parlors, in bombs or bodybuilding. God takes no pleasure in corporate efficiency or balanced budgets or welfare systems or legal processes when these things are the treasure in which we hope or the achievement in which we boast. Why? Because when we put our hope in horses and legs, then horses and legs get the glory, not God. And after all, that's what this is all about, this psalm. Give God the glory, not man, not these props. Give God the glory for his love and all these other attributes. So, When you praise the Lord, praise him for loving you and make sure that you are trusting in his love rather than in some human device. Now, as I said, God may may use a human device, but that's not where our trust should be, but in the Lord. It's exactly that what David wanted his people Israel to know and, and to do, to trust the Lord as they faced an upcoming conflict with some Gentile enemy. Well, we know that was the case because of the way David closes this psalm. Notice the last two verses, 20 through 22. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you, having called the people of God to praise God and then giving, giving them reasons to praise him because he's powerful, he's faithful, he's righteous, he's loving. Now we learn what was behind this psalm all along. Israel was facing some threat of war and David wants his people as they are facing this to trust the Lord And that's why he tells them how great God is. And they ought to be praising God and not worrying. They ought to be praising God for being powerful and faithful and righteous and loving. And so he closes the psalm by calling Israel to apply what they have learned about God. Apply it by trusting him, trusting this God who is so great and so worthy of their praise. As Israel awaited for 
a military battle to take place, a battle that threatened their very, their very lives, they prayed. And this is how the psalm closes, by asking the Lord's loving kindness to be upon them because their trust was in him, not in their military might. Their trust was in him and all that he has said he is. And folks, we have to apply this psalm too. It's about applying it, being doers of the word, not hearers only. We apply it by praising God for who he is, this powerful, faithful, righteous, and loving supreme being. We need to trust him. Trust that he is acting in your best interests as you and I face problems and difficulties in life. So praise God for who he is. Trust him to demonstrate who he is in your life. That is the message of Psalm 33. Now, if you are a believer in Christ, if you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then obeying the words of the psalm means that you'll be more active than ever in praising him and worshiping him. And the way he says that you are to worship him, and when you come to church, you're going to sing to him with your heart, with your voice, but your heart behind your voice, thinking about new and fresh applications of his grace and praising him for who he is. That's how you apply this. It also means that you'll trust God for who he is to help you, no matter how difficult your situation might be. He who is all-powerful and faithful will accomplish his will, and he's righteous in all that he does and loving beyond all measure. He will be there for you. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never trusted him as your Savior, then understand he is ready to make himself known to you if only you will turn from your sin of being self-absorbed, self-centered, a worshiper of self, and you turn from your sin, admit your sin, and trust Christ that when he died on the cross for sinners that you were included. Trust him for your eternal salvation because there is no other way to be eternally saved, to be rescued from the penalty of our sins. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And by coming through him, he means that you humble yourself by admitting your sinfulness and placing your soul confidence in him and him alone for your eternal salvation. I urge you to do this. I'm going to lead in prayer, and then you're not dismissed yet because we are going to call up some new members who are joining the church today. But join me in prayer. Father, thank you for being who you are. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself. If you didn't reveal yourself, we would never know you. Thank you that you took the first move. You revealed yourself in your word. You revealed yourself to us by making yourself known in our, in our lives, causing us to be born again, and causing the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to shine into our hearts. Now, Lord, we pray for those who don't know you. Would you open their hearts like you've opened most of ours, that they might know you, that they might trust you for salvation. And for those, Lord, who do know you, I pray that our worship would be enhanced. I pray that it will be deeper, more profound for you, not for us, but for you. I pray that you'll help us long after we close this, this service that you'll impress upon us how powerful you are, how faithful, how righteous, how loving you are. And that we would praise you every day, not, not just on Sundays, but every day with meaning, uh, with understanding. And then when we gather on Sundays, may our worship bring you great praise, Lord. Help us to sing new songs to you, Lord, of reflections of new grace in our lives, things that you're showing us all the time. We pray, Father that um, you'll help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Help us to not put our trust, Lord, in anyone, medical personnel, human devices, prescription drugs, all these things. We know you can use them, and you do use them, but help us to trust you so that nothing else gets the glory but you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.